It was one of the most romantic railroads of the American Southwest. Hop aboard the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, next on Trains Unlimited. Topeka and Santa Fe is a story of romance and adventure. It was a transcontinental railroad with a strong heritage in the American Southwest, a line famous for its speedy service and plush passenger trains. The railway served every sector of American life. It brought settlers west, transported tourists to remote reaches of the American landscape, and delivered produce to countless cities across the United States. From its first passenger excursion in 1869 to its profitable freight service in its final years, the Santa Fe came to symbolize America's industrial ingenuity. The Santa Fe Railroad's beginnings were humble, but the company's vision was grand. The railroad was the dream of one man, Cyrus K. Holliday. Colonel Holliday, as he was commonly called, was a lawyer living in Meadville, Pennsylvania. But his ambitions extended beyond his law practice. He saw limitless potential in the vast, empty prairies west of the Missouri River. In December of 1854, Holliday and his associates established the town of Topeka, Kansas, and made it the state capital. But Holliday didn't stop there. He hungered to start his own business, to build a railroad along the old Santa Fe Trail. It was a bumpy, uneven road that began in Independence, Missouri, and ended in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the trading center of the Southwest. For decades, traders and settlers had traveled on this rough and rugged route by horse and covered wagon. But Holiday thought more Americans would come west if they could speed across the country in luxurious railroad cars. He would begin his railroad in Kansas and branch out from there. It was not a popular dream altogether in those days, but on the other hand, there were several railroad uh, uh, projects being talked about in Kansas, and his, his was one that, uh, that came true. He had, to, he had to find money, which nobody wanted to lend him, or not enough people wanted to lend him. Envisioning building a railroad was one thing, but getting the funds to actually lay down the ties and tracks was another. But in 1860, Colonel Holliday set out to fulfill his dream. The entrepreneur and a few of his friends pooled together their investments to form the Atchison and Topeka Railroad Company. Holliday was named president, but the colonel felt the railroad should have a grander name, so it was changed to the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe. Colonel Holliday's intuitions were right. The time was ripe to build a railroad. In 1863, President Abraham Lincoln signed a bill granting Santa Fe millions of acres of government land along its proposed route across Kansas. In return, the railroads agreed to discount government freight. Holliday now had land to build his railroad but he soon ran into another roadblock, the Civil War. During the war between the states, money was hard to come by. Holliday finally persuaded the government to give the Santa Fe previous unallotted lands in an Indian reservation north of Topeka to sell to settlers. 
It was desirable land, and the Santa Fe was able to get over $4 an acre for it. That provided the money to begin building. In October of 1868, ground was finally broken in Topeka, Kansas. The sound of hammering spikes meant employment was to be had. Track gangs were hired to lay down the steel rails and wooden ties. The labor was backbreaking, the terrain was barren, water was scarce, and deadly rattlesnakes were plentiful. But the Santa Fe workers were skilled and well paid. Building a railroad across Kansas was a great challenge. It stretched over 300 plus miles of prairie. Everything had to be brought in from the east. Ties for the railroad had to be hauled in from forested areas outside of Kansas. And since the state had no steel mills, rails also had to be brought in. It was all very expensive. But the costly challenge paid off. On April 26, 1869, the Santa Fe's first locomotive, called the Cyrus K. Holiday, took its first excursion down seven miles of steel track in Wakarusa, Kansas. Townspeople came out for a free ride and a picnic celebration. During the festivities, Holiday boldly announced his ambitions for the future of the railroad. He promised to one day extend service to Chicago, St. Louis, California, and all the way down to Mexico City. Colonel Holliday's ambitions for his railroad were grand, but he still needed more funds to continue his construction. This meant luring more and more immigrants to purchase land from the railroad and then encourage them to produce crops the railroad could haul. The Santa Fe found a group of farmers who were eager to immigrate. They were Mennonites, a Christian sect who were being persecuted by the Tsar in the Ukraine, which was formerly the Soviet Union. The Mennonites were drawn to Kansas, where the climate was similar to the Ukraine. Hot summers, and cold winters. In 1870, they immigrated to Kansas by the thousands. They brought with them a hard red winter wheat that had to be sown in the fall and reaped in the spring. It was perfectly suited to the Midwestern climate. The wheat became a cash crop for the state of Kansas, as well as for the railroad. In time, Kansas became one of the leading producers of wheat in the United States. Colonel Holliday and the Santa Fe were not alone in their quest for success. The competition among railroads had intensified. In the late 1870s, the Santa Fe found itself in a war with the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad. Both companies wanted to lay tracks across the Raton Pass which lay on the border between Colorado and New Mexico. On a dark night in February of 1878, the Santa Fe crew began secretly turning dirt and laying down track across the Raton Pass. By morning, the Santa Fe had one claim to the desirable route. The railroads were always in competition with each other. Once the telegraph came along, there was extensive use of the telegraph because, of course, that was a very quick way to communicate. Santa Fe had several different levels of codes that were used in transmitting telegraphs, so they would be absolutely nonsensical to anybody reading them. The Santa Fe was also competitive in their steam locomotive design. By 1890, they were building what were called compound locomotives. 
these engines achieved speeds of 106 miles per hour. They also used steam twice before exhausting. This feature was particularly desirable for traveling across the barren southwest, where water for steam engines was scarce. Running across an arid climate is very difficult for a railroad relying on steam locomotives. By its nature, a steam locomotive relies on water to operate. It's a tea kettle. It boils the water and uses the expanding steam to move the train. Santa Fe struggled with water through most of its steam operating years, uh, particularly out in Arizona and New Mexico where water is very hard to come by. The company resorted to drilling a number of very deep wells and these were prized possessions that the company had into the 1990s. The Santa Fe refused to let the arid climate stand in the way of progress. The railroad continued pushing west. Track gangs mastered engineering feats by building railroad bridges over the Missouri River and Canyon Diablo. By 1885, the railroad had made its way into California. Three years later, it had completed two lines to Los Angeles and was winding its way up the coast. The Santa Fe not only built track, but in the process built up towns and communities across the west and southwest. The railroad brought commerce to and from cities. It shipped cattle up from Texas, buffalo hides from Dodge City, Kansas, and fresh produce from California. U.S. mail now could be delivered by train instead of stagecoach. This would bring high revenue to the Santa Fe Company. As the railroad became more popular, the train depot became the social center in many towns. Almost everybody coming to or leaving the city had to pass through the depot. Colonel Holliday almost lived to see his dream fulfilled. On March 29th, 1900, he died at the age of 73. That same year, Santa Fe's first freight train arrived in Northern California. Barges equipped with tracks carried freight cars across the bay to San Francisco. The railroad had been completed. The father of the Santa Fe left a legacy that would continue into the 20th century. The railroad would grow beyond Holiday's wildest imagination. His tracks would stretch over 13,000 miles. The men that followed in Holiday's footsteps would carry on his tradition and make the Santa Fe one of the great railroads of the world. The Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe became a symbol of mobility in America. No longer were Americans forced to ride in a bumpy, cramped stagecoach. The Santa Fe helped expand the West and at the same time changed railway passenger service forever. By the late 1880s, one of the railroad's popular routes was between Los Angeles and Kansas City. The passenger rates between these two destinations was one dollar, which was a very low fare even for that time. Some of the trains were over 600 feet in length. They carried luxurious passenger cars operated by Chicago's Pullman Company. Many were encased in mahogany with electrical lights and steam heating. They were lounges where travelers could read or play cards. They even provided sleeping accommodations for an extra charge. Some of these cars included a toilet and sink. In the early days of railroad travel, there were no dining cars. Trains stopped at roadhouses along the way. Menus typically offered rancid bacon, canned beans, and coffee a week old. These crude conditions and the threat of food poisoning 
discouraged many Americans from traveling west. Then in 1875, one man came along to change railroad food and service forever. His name was Fred Harvey. Like Colonel Holliday, Fred Harvey was a visionary. Born in London, England, Harvey came to America in the late 1850s to become a chef. He showed off his culinary talents in fine restaurants in New York City and New Orleans. In 1861, Harvey's career took a turn. The Civil War broke out. The restaurant business was hit hard. Harvey was out of work. He eventually found a job with the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad as a freight agent. Appalled by the food and service along the railroad line, he quickly saw an opportunity to start a new business. In 1875, Harvey opened two cafes on the Kansas Pacific Railroad. They were so successful that he went to the Santa Fe Railroad with a proposition. If they would give him a depot restaurant in Topeka, Kansas, he would supply their railroad passengers with food for royalty. The Santa Fe was still a new railroad at the time, eager to experiment with new ideas. So in January of 1878, the Santa Fe made an oral agreement with Fred Harvey. The two were now in business together. The initial agreements with Harvey were all verbal and informal and he was given really a blank check to set up a series of eating houses and that expanded into hotels and and special hotels that had names uh, and lunch rooms you know whatever whatever the location seemed to call for harvey would run with whatever would work and set it up Fred Harvey's contract with the Santa Fe allowed him to operate eating houses, lunch stands, and hotels all along the railroad. By the late 1880s, there was a Harvey house every hundred miles along the entire Santa Fe line. Harvey eventually operated several dining cars on the Santa Fe. The rooms were as elegant as fine restaurants. The oak tables were dressed with the railroad's own china, called the California Poppy. The Santa Fe agreed to haul fresh meat and produce free of charge to any Harvey house. And Fred Harvey was known to request food from every corner of the country. He brought in sea turtles from the Gulf of Mexico and shipped them to the plains of Kansas. Fresh cold melons were hauled from California to the New Mexico desert. All perishables arrived in Santa Fe's refrigerator cars, which were filled with ice blocks to keep everything fresh and cold. Fred Harvey Meals All the Way became the motto of the Santa Fe Railroad. It was said his establishments offered food fine enough to be served in Paris restaurants. Among other delicacies, this Harvey menu from 1885 offered a lobster salad, stuffed turkey with cranberries, and New York ice cream. The servings were ample enough to satisfy the hungriest appetites. Harvey demanded his chefs to cut beef portions as thick as a man's fist and slice pies in fours instead of sixes. A seven-course meal cost the traveler 75 cents, a fair price at the time. When you were going from Chicago to wherever, ultimately to Los Angeles or San Francisco, the train would make a lunch stop. And, and believe it or not, everybody would get off and eat lunch in half an hour because there were all, this, all these signal, signals set up by the Harvey crew that they knew how to get all these people fed and back on the train. And you do the same thing for a dinner stop. Harvey's fine taste and Englishman's manners were expressed in the food, as well as the service. He was a perfectionist. Nothing escaped his notice. Harvey was known to make unannounced inspections of his establishments. Chefs and waiters were known to shudder when he came through the door. Harvey was said to throw out chipped dinner plates. He was even known 
to completely overturn a poorly set table. Railroad customers were not spared from Harvey's scrutiny. Men were required to wear a coat and tie in many Harvey House dining rooms. It's no wonder Fred Harvey became known as the Civilizer of the West. But even Harvey couldn't control the rough and rowdy men whom he employed in his establishments. Many employees picked fights with customers, came to work drunk, or didn't come to work at all. Someone suggested to Harvey that he hire all women waitresses to avoid the problems he'd been having with the men. Harvey loved the idea. With a scarcity of women on the western frontier, he put ads in eastern newspapers. He wanted women who were single, educated, attractive, and well-mannered. Many skeptics wondered if a refined woman would venture to the western frontier. But in 1883, they came by the thousands. Never before had there been such an employment opportunity for women. Some ventured west for adventure. Others couldn't find work back home. They were eventually called the Harvey Girls. And these waitresses became a railroad institution. In 1944, actress Judy Garland immortalized the thousands of women that came west in the MGM classic film, The Harvey Girls. But even as the movie was being made, the real waitresses of the Wild West had already become living legends. From the 1880s until the middle of the 20th century, they had helped to make the Santa Fe Railroad a household name. I became a Harvey girl because uh, I couldn't go to college and I needed something to do that was, uh, that was permanent, that went on and on. Uh, it was a busy job, you were on your feet, uh, you know. My shift was from 10 in the morning till 2 in the afternoon. You were on your feet. You had to be on your toes. You were, you know, alert to all the things that went around, went on around you. And uh, it, was, it was a good job at that time. We got our room. We got our meals. We got our uniforms washed. We got our tips. And we got our wages, which was $25 a month. Fred Harvey was known to be strict with his girls. They were forbidden to wear makeup or chew gum during their shift. Most importantly, they were not allowed to marry during their contract, although many Harvey girls did get married and were subsequently fired. If the rules of the contract were strict, the responsibilities of the job were even more demanding. A Harvey girl's first responsibility was to always make fresh urns of coffee every hour so passengers and railroad workers were always assured a fresh cup each harvey girl was also required to wear a starch black uniform with a white apron if she got one spot on her uniform during her shift she was to change it immediately i enjoyed my uh, work as a harvey girl as a waitress um, there's certain reward in making people feel good. And of course, when you eat, that makes you feel good. And we always tried to give the people what they wanted. One of the things that they trained us uh, to do was to always be aware, to anticipate the needs of the guests. Uh, always keep the water glasses filled and keep their coffee cups filled. Just the appearance of the Harvey girls along the Santa Fe Railroad was said to have tamed many Western men. Hundreds of railroad workers ended up marrying Harvey girls. Fred Harvey's standard of excellence carried on well after his death. In February of 1901, 
the chef who brought elegant dining to the West died of intestinal cancer. His last words to his sons were, don't cut the ham too thin, boys. Fred Harvey's legend lived on. His sons and daughter took over the Harvey establishments, which grew to 15 hotels, 47 lunch and dining rooms, and 30 dining cars. With help from Fred Harvey, the Santa Fe Railroad set the standard for Western train travel. By the late 19th century, railroads had become big business in the United States. They were one of the country's largest employers. Trains were the means by which people and products moved across the country. Transcontinental railroads such as the Santa Fe wielded power and influence over the government. By 1883, the railroads created the country's uniform time zones, Eastern, Central, Mountain, and Pacific time. This assured the trains always departed and arrived on time. Railroads became the lifeline of communities, so much that by 1910, 95% of the U.S. population lived near a train depot. Throughout its history, the Santa Fe was known to push itself to the forefront of railroad innovation, always wanting the latest in car design and comfort. When Chicago became the hub for train travel, the Santa Fe, like other railroads, competed for passenger business between the Windy City and the West Coast. In an era obsessed with speed, the railroad tried everything from price wars to promotional gimmicks to attract passengers. In 1905, an eccentric mining millionaire named Walter Scott walked into the Santa Fe office in Los Angeles. He dared the railroad to take him from Los Angeles to Chicago faster than anybody had traveled before. The Santa Fe accepted the challenge. In a train called the Death Valley Scotty, the Santa Fe got Walter Scott into Chicago in less than 45 hours, a record for that time. This made the Santa Fe Railroad the leader in speedy service between Chicago and the West Coast. Santa Fe was interested in promoting high-end passenger travel and worked hard to develop that segment of the market from the 1890s through the end of its passenger traffic in 1971. At first, the California Limited offered a three-day journey between Chicago and California. Uh, at that time, air conditioning did not exist, uh, but there was a measure of luxury that was added to the trip when the train arrived in California a uniformed servant boarded the train and handed out flowers to the lady passengers and wallets to the male passengers. In 1911, the Santa Fe upgraded their passenger trains by introducing the Deluxe. This train operated only once a week between Chicago and Los Angeles, and it was much faster than the California Limited. In the late 1920s, Hollywood became the mecca for movie making. The Santa Fe brought a glamorous looking train to cater to the Hollywood set. They called it the Chief. By the 1930s, celebrities hopped aboard an even more luxurious line called the Super Chief. This locomotive quickly became known as the train of the stars for such actors as Clark Gable, Mae West, and Shirley Temple. But the Santa Fe didn't exclusively provide service for the rich and famous. In time, the railroad would become one of the leading transporters of tourists to the American Southwest. By the 1920s, leisure travel was increasing among America's middle class. Tourists wanted to come west to see nature's monuments, such as the Grand Canyon, Monument Valley, and Yosemite. We'd take the train, and there were times when we took the sleepers. And uh, 
At that time, the sleepers were much different than they are this day and age. They were in all in one in one car. They were just separated, and they had curtains rather than the separate rooms like they have in the modern trains. Along with comfortable sleeping cars, Santa Fe passengers were no longer forced to stay in dingy hotels when the train made overnight stops at cities along the way. The Fred Harvey Company hired the acclaimed architect, Mary Coulter, to design luxurious hotels along the railroad, such as the El Tovar Hotel near the Grand Canyon, and the La Posada, built right next to the tracks in Winslow, Arizona. The Santa Fe Railway Company also began an advertising campaign in order to lure more tourists to the Southwest. They commissioned artists to paint Western landscapes. In turn, the railroad used the artwork on promotional brochures, travel posters, and their own magazine. Never before had a railroad gone to such imaginative means to increase passenger service. In 1915, the Fred Harvey Company also provided guided tours from the railroad to many scenic spots unable to be reached by train. They loaded tourists in Harvey cars. These Packard model automobiles caravan to notable landmarks in the Southwest. No extra cost was charged to the Santa Fe passengers. There were even Harvey couriers on hand to provide personalized tours. The Santa Fe and the Fred Harvey Company not only promoted the natural wonders of the Southwest, but also its native people. In 1925, they offered passenger excursions called Indian Detours. Fred Harvey knew how to spell tourism forward and backward, and he convinced the Santa Fe to go along with him. Harvey came up with the idea of an Indian detour, and that meant you would stop and get off the train and stay in a given area of the Southwest and, and spend two or three days going out and visiting Indian Pueblos and seeing how the Indians lived at first hand. No other railroad had this Southwest place of business. And I think that just made all the difference in the world in how the Santa Fe grew and developed. And no other place in the country had this gift of Native American art and way of life to, to look at and to explore. The Santa Fe also encouraged Native Americans to sell their pottery, jewelry, and woven goods to passengers at their train depots. Over time, Indian crafts were eventually displayed in museums built inside the Harvey Hotels. Were it not for the Native Americans, the Pueblo Indians, the Navajo, probably many other tribes, I don't know that we would have a Santa Fe Railway across the Southwest as early as, uh, uh, as we had it. The Indians helped build the Santa Fe. In the early days, they considered it an honor to work for the Santa Fe. And the Santa Fe, I think, returned the respect and returned the, uh, returned the opportunity, not only with employment, but uh, as, a, as a maker of a market for, uh, for uh, Native American crafts. While the Fred Harvey Company was exposing railway passengers to Native American culture, it was also encroaching on the privacy of the Indian people. Flocks of tourists paraded through Pueblo villages. Some communities disliked the intrusion, but many Native Americans, particularly women, welcomed the income the railroad passengers brought through the sales of their art objects. For better or worse, the Santa Fe Railway opened the world to the American Southwest. By the 20th century, it was more than just a railroad moving people and products. 
it was a company transporting images and ideas across the country. The Santa Fe Railway's passenger service provided the glitter and glamour for the company. But it was the freight service that paid the bills. Santa Fe's freight cars hauled cattle from the Texas Plains, winter wheat from Kansas prairies, and precious metals from Colorado mines. An important part of the Santa Fe's freight service was the ability to transport perishable goods on long hauls between Chicago and California. The railroad stopped constantly along the way to re-ice their refrigeration cars. The process was costly and time-consuming. Very early in the game, uh, somebody uh, Somebody built ice bunkers in the end of a boxcar and insulated the car and they'd fill the bunkers up with ice periodically as the train came east. It was costly, it was time consuming, you had to make the ice, you had to transport it. Cars had to be re-iced every few hundred miles. Starting in the late 1930s, the railroad got a boost to its freight service. Diesel-powered locomotives were being developed. The Santa Fe was one of the first companies to begin using diesels. They performed 64% more work than steam locomotives and have rated as high as 6,000 horsepower per unit. The Santa Fe Railway's freight and passenger service showed respectable profits during the early 1930s. But when the Depression swept the country, the railroad had to cut back. Trains were discontinued, Many employees lost work. The railroad business remained slow until the U.S. entered World War II in 1941. At that point, transportation demands on the railroad accelerated to an all-time high. The Santa Fe moved men and materials across the country to ocean ports. To help allies rebuild their war-torn railroad systems, Santa Fe employees joined Army Railroad Battalions. Back home, employment opportunities were available everywhere. Many Harvey houses were reopened to serve the troop trains. Hundreds of retired Harvey girls dusted off their uniforms and returned to work. I don't know which had more of an impact, World War II on the railroads or the railroads on World War II. I don't think we could have been as victorious as we were had it not been for the railroads. This was before there was any significant airline travel, so the only way to move both men and material in terms of the military was the railroads. And the railroads, just all the railroads pitched in Every last little steam locomotive was dragged out of its hiding place to augment the, the engine power it needed. By the end of World War II, freight business had doubled, and passenger traffic was three times what it had been at the beginning of the war. The Santa Fe Railway now anticipated a profitable future in the post-war era. with the Santa Fe was one of the most popular railroad slogans of all times. It included Chico, the cartoon Navajo boy. The popularity of the television in the 1950s gave the Santa Fe Railway another vehicle in which to promote its passenger service. And at the same time, they continued to incorporate Native American themes into their advertisements. The Santa Fe tried to revive its passenger business with catchy commercials, as well as upgrading its fleet of passenger trains. By the 1950s, the railway's top luxury models were still the El Capitan and the Super Chief.
both trains operated between Chicago and Los Angeles, speeding across the country in only 39 hours and 45 minutes. Just how comfortable can train travel be? Well, here's the one and only answer to that question, the new Super Chief, flagship of Santa Fe's great fleet of fleet streamliners. Santa Fe, among the Western railroads, probably had the flashiest fleet of, uh, of diesel-powered streamliners, and El Capitan for a coach train was, uh, was equally as luxurious as a Super Chief. You all had reserve seats, paid a little extra fare to ride it, had lunch counter diners, which uh, you, where you could either sit at a table or, or sit at a lunch counter. Great train, rode it many times. The new Super Chief, one day out of Chicago, rolling along on cushioned springs to give you the smoothest ride of your life. For moving around space, so important on long trips, the new Super Chief offers the attractive observation lounge, end car on the train. There's real comfort in this delightful lounge. A pleasant room to be in if you like people and the informal flow of social pleasantry. The Santa Fe's upgraded Super Chief was called an apartment on wheels. It offered a drawing room, dining cars, and cocktail lounges. The train also offered spacious sleeping quarters that could accommodate up to three passengers. And included with the comfort and luxury, the train's most practical feature at the time was speed. The Super Chief regularly exceeded 100 miles per hour in certain districts and achieved a record-breaking 2,225-mile run between Los Angeles and Chicago. The diesel locomotive set the standard in streamlined luxury trains. But by the 1960s, even the fast-moving Super Chief couldn't keep enough passengers aboard to pay the bills. The Santa Fe's passenger business was on a rapid decline. Americans' love of the automobile hurt the railways. So too did the growing airline industry. In October of 1967, the U.S. Post Office told the Santa Fe that first-class mail would now move by airplane. This reduced the Santa Fe's passenger revenue by $35 million a year, making the passenger trains hopelessly unprofitable. The federal government made an effort to save passenger trains. It offered to manage passenger service for railroads that wanted to participate. The Santa Fe agonized over joining this program, but its loss in revenues soon forced the decision. In 1971, the government created Amtrak a new corporation to operate passenger trains. All railroad companies, including the Santa Fe, eventually turned over their passenger service to Amtrak. By 1972, Santa Fe no longer provided passenger service. The railway now needed to increase its freight service revenues. The company used its fast route between Chicago and California to heighten promotion of its intermodal service. Since 1950, the Santa Fe had been carrying truck trailers on trains. A single train could take 100 trucks off the highway. By 1964, the Santa Fe handled over 200,000 trailers. And in 1979, the company pioneered the 10-pack fuel-efficient spline intermodal car. The Santa Fe remained a profitable railroad through the 1970s and 1980s. But in the 1990s, mergers were on the minds of many American corporations, and the railroads were no exception. The Santa Fe needed to find a way to reduce overhead expenses, and at the same time, continue the reputation for service they've maintained since the 1880s. The Santa Fe was great at going from Chicago to California, but it couldn't take anything to New York. It couldn't take anything to Seattle. 
in order to do that, it had to work with other lines. But if those other lines came into Santa Fe's territory, they could compete for that traffic, and Santa Fe was closed out. So Santa Fe was forced to find a merger partner to get bigger. In 1996, the Santa Fe finally merged with the Burlington Northern Railroad to form the Burlington Northern and Santa Fe Railway. Today, the new company has over 31,000 miles of track, stretching from British Columbia to Florida. It generates billions of dollars of revenue a year. The merger gave the Santa Fe a future, but the railroad's identity will forever remain in the past. In the romantic era when steam locomotives moved passengers to unexplored regions of the American West. The railroad's 100-year heritage conjures up the imagery of its founder, Cyrus K. Holliday, the meals and surface of the Fred Harvey establishments, and the art and culture of the Southwest. The Santa Fe Railroad of yesteryear will be remembered as one of the great American railroads.